Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Practicing Presence While Black, Tips and Tools for Managing Anxiety. Um, my name is Yolo Akili, and I am joined by um, the brilliant Dr. Dion Bates. Dion, you want to say hello to everyone? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to get started. We're going to give a couple of moments for people. We see people are coming in the room, steadily see the numbers climbing. We're going to give like a minute or two to let people get in, and then we're going to dive in to make sure we honor and respect your time that you are so graciously sharing with us and trusting us to um, hold the space that we're going to have today exploring anxiety and our mental health. So just a few more moments, um, and then we'll get started, okay? Um, while we're getting, while people are coming in the room and we're getting ready to get started, before we get started with the actual curriculum, um, I want to just remind, and show everyone that um, on your screen, you should be able to see a control panel. And on that control panel, you have a couple of different options of things you can do that we'll be using throughout the course of our time together. Um, so one of them, you have a little box where you can write in questions. Anytime you have a question to myself or to the group, um, that's also a place where you will type in um, responses to questions that we will pose. You can type those in there. Uh, we also will type things in there to speak to you as well. Um, in addition to that, you also have a handouts panel. Um, we've given a couple of different handouts that we're going to use today that we want you to please share and disseminate, but you'll be able to download those and we'll use them in the context of our worksheet, um, our time together. And then also there's an option on there too um, for you to raise your hand. You might see next to your name an option to raise your hand. At different points in our conversation today, we'll offer an opportunity for you to like, you know, raise your hand and say that um, you are, uh, I have questions, and we will answer that question. All right. So let me check in with my. Um, I have my. I see my. Uh, some staff folks in the room. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see if I saw. I thought I saw. Uh, Mefti in there. Mefti, if you can just send me a message and give me the okay that um, you know, my wig is on straight, that everything is seen, so we can make sure we do our tech check before we get started. I appreciate that. <laughs> What we have to do before we get started. Um, I think I have a thank you, Mefti. I appreciate it, Mefti. Thank, thank you. Mefti says my wig looks lovely, which I deeply appreciate in this moment. <laughs> All right. So we have about 40 some people in the room. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, once again, welcome. So, welcome everyone who just joined us to Practicing Presence While Black Tips and Tools for Managing Anxiety. This is a presentation of BEAM, the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. My name is Yolo Akili, and I am joined by Dr. Dion Bates, who we will introduce later on to present this presentation. Um, as with all things, let's start off with the spirit of gratitude um, that we recognize that you are taking time out of your day to spend time with us in this hour and a half to talk about anxiety, to explore how it's showing up in our lives. We don't take that for granted. So I want to say we're grateful for your time, and we pray, and we, our hope is and our intention is to fill that time with skills and tools and strategies that can be useful and helpful for all of us on our journey. All right? So before we begin anything, um, we know that folks are in different places and across the country, across the world maybe even. Um, we always like to begin by grounding ourselves and to do a, just having a moment we just kind of check in with ourselves before we get into the nitty gritty of this topic, right? So I want to invite folks wherever you are, if you are sitting, if you are standing, if you're in your car, wherever you are, to just try to take a moment to ground and center yourself, right? And there's a couple of things we can do to help ourselves with this. Um, sometimes if we're sitting in a chair, for example, maybe we might put our feet on the ground in a way that helps us feel rooted. Maybe we, if we're laying on the floor, we might lay out um, and we might just relax our shoulders or relax our face. Um, but just take a moment to just really kind of quick connect like to uh, the tension that you may be feeling and just trying to release that tension briefly and connect with your breath and just pay attention to what's coming up in your body. You know? This is a space that's going to center black folks and black lives and so it's important that we spend some time honoring and being present with what's going on with our body right now. Um, these bodies that our folks have fought so hard to for us to be able to be present in. And so I'm going to invite us to just take maybe like 10 seconds to just pause. If you'd like to, you can close your eyes and take a deep breath. You might put your heart, your palm on your um, on your heart if you like. Take a few moments to just pause.
All right. Um, sacred pause is a practice we put in place. It's just sometimes 10, 15 seconds of just not doing anything can do a lot for your emotional well-being or just kind of to recenter you, all right? So thank you for practicing and enjoying that with me. Um, another thing, before we get into anything, I want to be very clear about let you know where you are at, who you are, are joining. Um, this is a space that is a part of a lineage. Um, that as we do this work, talking about black healing, about healing in black communities, addressing anxiety, depression, whatever we are addressing, we are a part of a history of black healers across the world. Um, people of African descent, African folks who have been doing healing work as black trans folks, queer folks, non-binary people, um, from all faiths and backgrounds, from big mamas to cooks to healers, tarot readers to Christian religious leaders, we are a part of a legacy. We are here, all of us who are present here, as black folks, we are here because somewhere um, along our lineage, folks had some tools and some strategies to heal. And so as we do our work today, we do not do our work in isolation. We do not do our work. We are not the genesis of this work. We are just the continuation of this legacy. And so we are calling that legacy of healing, that legacy of resilience, of transformation, of making so much out of so little into the space and uplifting the skills and talents and strategies that we as black folks have always had um, and refining them and, 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 and celebrating them and bringing them into the space. So Ashe. when you, as you, Ashe, and so in this space, we are honoring that, that, that truth. I am honoring the healer within each of you who is present. We all have the capacity to heal and our healers in our world. And so I'm honoring that, bringing that into the room, honoring that we all have expertise and brilliance that we can share today. That while Dr. Bates and I will come into the space and we'll bring some things, we are by no means the absolute end, and that there is so much more knowledge and so much more power in um, each of us. Um, one oh, of my shit. favorite quotes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite quotes um, from Julie Dash is, we are the daughters of those who have chosen to survive. I often modify it and say we are the children and the daughters of those who have chosen to survive and thrive, lifting that up, where we come from and who we are. So honoring that in our space and time together. This presentation is brought to you by BEAM. BEAM is the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. We are a national training, movement building, and grant making organization dedicated to the healing, wellness, and liberation of Black and marginalized communities. Um, oops, I think I got my slides a little bit out of place. Oh, okay. You can learn more about us. I'm sorry, there we go. Um, a little bit about how BEAM works. So we have three buckets of our work. One is training, one is grant making, and another one is organizational wellness and coaching. Our training, which is the heart of our work, is we believe that in order for our communities to heal, Black people in all steps and all walks of life have, must have skills and tools and strategies that help them implement healing justice. So it's not just like relying on psychiatrists and social workers, this Western model that says it must be about professionalization. No, we reject that. And we say that everybody in our community needs to have tools and strategies to heal within boundaries of their skill set. So that means the coaches, the teachers, the barbers, that a lot of those folks who already provide emotional health and healing work in our communities every single day. And we can train and uplift the skills and strategies they have and also refine them to make sure that we're sharing accurate health information that we can create wraparound healing communities, right? And so our approach is really centered in healing justice and understanding that it is about systems, it is about community and transformation, not the Western clinical model that often assumes that it's all about someone who's outside of our community offering insight and care. Um, we said that no actually needs to be wraparound. So those are our three buckets. You can see on the right, our social media. Please follow us, Twitter, Instagram, as well as on our website. We have lots of tools and videos on our website. We encourage folks to share. Um, and some of those you've been given today. But you can learn more about us, those mediums, all right? Um, this scowly face person who has a fresh haircut, who is not who I am today, <laughs> with a fresh haircut. Um, my name is Yolo Kili Robinson, as some of you know, um, executive director and founder of BEAM. I've been working actually in public health about 15 years, started in reproductive justice work, moved into HIV and AIDS work in black communities. Um, from there, I've done a lot of family intervention counseling, working with men who have committed assault and battery, working with people living with HIV, as well as using substances and injecting drugs. And so I have a lot of vast, vast experience at those intersections. Um, my work is very much so informed by black feminism and healing justice, um, which healing justice essentially at this core um, acknowledging that in order for us to heal, we have to also dismantle racism, transphobia, ableism, sexism on a structural systemic level, that it's not about the individual healing, but the collective healing within the individual as well. And so um, that's a little bit about me and I'll be uh, and the work that I do 
um, as the executive director of Bean. Dr. Bates, you gonna tell them about who you is? Oh, you are doing such a beautiful job. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone on the East Coast. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone over on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Dr. Dion Bates. I am the senior senior mental health advisor for um, Beam. Um, when I am not uh, consulting with Beam uh, full time, I am in private practice in the Atlanta area um, through my own practice, Self Solstice LLC. Uh, I am a licensed professional counselor. I am a member of the Licensed uh, Professional Counselors Association of Georgia. I'm also a certified professional counselor supervisor. Um, I've been in the counseling and mental health field for many, many years, um, doing everything from doing direct care to private practice to uh, working at university counseling centers to teaching graduate school. Um, Currently, I work with a wide range of different um, mental health conditions and um, located here in the Atlanta area. And that's a little bit about me. I'm looking forward to everyone today as, and looking really looking forward to learning from you all. Um, this will be an interactive presentation. And that's one of the things that that Beam really prides itself on is doing very interactive presentations so that not only can we share information that has been passed on to us, but we can also continue to um, increase our own knowledge base by learning from those participants who, who come into our trainings. So thank you all for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Dion, for being here. So excited to have you here. Now, what Dion didn't tell you is that Dion likes to cut up. So you know we're gonna we're gonna talk about these serious topics, but we a lot of a lot of our strategies around you know in black communities you know we like to we like to like you know humor is the way we cope right humor is the way we like navigate things, but it's also it helps us make it more lively and engaging. So Dion Dion's not in person with you all, so there will be no Dion has a tendency to throw shoes when she gets really excited about something. So luckily but there'll be not no not shoes not though. not like Dr. Maddie Moss Clark now. <laughs> oh, Lord, not, not like that. Not like that. Not not like that. But, but when and, something and, and, and happens, that, <laughs> right? So, but with, so so when I get excited about something that's really good, I love throwing shoes at people. Right. right so right. you all will be spared that today, but I might throw a handkerchief or two at you. Okay. 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 So not shoe throwing as a site of trauma, <laughs> but shoe throwing as a place of healing. Okay. That's a different webinar. We'll have that. Y'all y'all come to that one next week. We'll tell you about what's going All right. All right. <laughs> All right. So moving on, um, I'm going to do a couple of things, do some container building, just to make sure that we have some clarity about the approach that being takes in our time together so you understand where we're coming from. First, being very clear to all of my Black folks, beautiful people in the room, this is a space that centers all Black lives, not just the Black folks that you like or the kind of Black people that you like. If we center Black queer folks, Black straight folks, Black Muslims, Christians, um, disabled folks, we are crafting a space that honors all Blackness. All Blackness is welcome is what we like to say. Um, and we also want to be clear that um, for folks who are in the room who are our allies, we are grateful for your presence in the space. But we want to be very clear that this space centers Black folks and that if any time you experience any anxiety or discomfort, we understand that as much of the anxiety and discomfort we experience living in a world that is deeply anti-Black, we want to invite you to uh, manage your discomfort and also in, and be very clear and honest with you that um, while we're so grateful that you're here to learn about anxiety in Black communities, because we need all of our folks, regardless of background, to know these things, um, any attempts to decentralize Blackness from this space will be compassionately redirected. We will make sure we maintain the center that this is about black folks and black lives and all of our complexities and nuances. So just uplifting that, thank you for being here. Um, great for you being here. And that is our focus and our purpose. All right, I'm gonna talk briefly about our core assumptions. Many of you who've been to BEAM workshops before, you probably heard me talk about our core assumptions. I'm, some, so I'm sure some of you all could recant them but we go through them because we have new folks every single day. We want you to know who you're in the room with, who you're rolling with. So if you decide to like, you know what, they're doing a lot, let me get on out of here. You can make that decision for yourself. Always consent, people always with consent. Um, first one is everyone has imminent value in this space. When we say imminent, it means inherent. It means that you are worthy by virtue of being present, by virtue of being here. 
not worthy because you look a certain way, because you produce a certain kind of way, because your body looks a certain kind of way. No, everything is, everyone is valuable and everything that you bring to this space, even when it is uncomfortable, ugly, makes us not feel good, can be valuable as a tool for us to learn and grow in connection with each other. So we do not throw people away. We will learn from each other. We might challenge each other. We might have to enforce some boundaries with each other and remind each other of how to hold us in dignity, but everyone has imminent value in this space, and that is a core assumption that Dean does in all of our work. Second one is we address behavior, ideas, and choices. We do not address the core of who people are. I might have a conversation with you and say that, hey, your behaviors in this space have been disrespectful. Your ideas you have presented have been transphobic. Your choices reflect misogyny, but I will never say that the core of who you are is wrong. I will never say the core of who you are is shameful. I will never say that you are problematic because we need to make some distinctions between our behaviors, ideas, and choices. We are responsible for them, but we are not them. I believe that in my own belief system that the core of who we are is spirit, um, and while we are responsible for our uh, behaviors, ideas, and choices, we are not them. So we want to invite us to do that, to use that framework as well to expand our tenderness and kindness with each other in terms of how we're doing our work. Third one is everyone has learned the isms and privilege. We do not ask the question if somebody is racist, transphobic, or homophobic. We think that's a really silly question in this cultural context. A more useful question is where is the transphobia, racism, homophobia, and misogyny that you have learned all your life as a person born in this world showing up in your behavior, life, and choices? We are no longer asking if it is there. If you are a Black person who has been brought up in this world, you have learned anti-Blackness. You have learned homophobia and transphobia and ableism. And therefore, in some ways, it influences your actions, choices, the policy, the structure that you create un unconsciously and sometimes not so unconsciously it is present. And so we're going with the place of curiosity to see where is that ugly that I learned that where is that well, where is that concept that i learned that taught me that certain lives are more valuable if they express in the way that somebody told me they should express we're going to go in there with curiosity and not with the moral condemnation but with openness and honesty that we have learned some really terrible things about who certain people and those things need to be unlearned in order for us to all get liberated and be free all right Last one is everyone's feelings are valid, even if the ideas informing those feelings are inaccurate. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. In the English language, feelings are often one word. I feel sad, I feel hurt, I feel frustrated. Sometimes people get confused and say, oh, feelings aren't facts, because they're confusing a fact with a story and a narrative. But feelings are not the narrative. Feelings are the somatic response, the emotional response, right? So the story I tell myself that generates the feeling of sadness and frustration, those are two different things. Sometimes we can have feelings, and those feelings we have um, are always valid, always valid. Even if the story that we're telling ourselves about how so-and-so is out to give me or so-and-so is doing this, that story might be completely inaccurate. But in order for us to transmute, to transform our, our feelings, we have to first make presence space for them and feel them in our bodies and in our spirits and, and, and move through them. And um, sometimes we get into a lot of trouble. I work in a lot of movement spaces and a lot of the young baby activists, they always want to have an intellectual fight about somebody's really hurt, somebody's really sad, but it's all about a philosophy. And they just go on for hours and hours because nobody can acknowledge and say that like actually just hurt my feelings. Actually, I'm just, I feel disrespected. Um, that is often what happens in our communities and in our homes when we don't um, create space and, and, and increase safety for feelings. And so we're going to do some work to kind of increase some safety around our feelings to dead together today as well, all right? Those are our core assumptions. That's how we do what we do. Um, we will come back to those probably through a course of our time together. And um, I invite you all to share and to uh, collaborate with us in, those, in um, honoring those core assumptions today, all right? All right. First activity of the day, like Dr. Dion said, we ain't finna have you sitting up on this computer and on this phone with us listen to us preach about um, whatever for an hour and a half without y'all getting involved, right? Because we are the work. And whatever gets in the way of the work is just the work, right? So one of the things we're gonna do today is we're gonna take some time to get in touch with our feelings. So in your handouts, you all have a copy of the feelings wheel. If, you have, if, you're, if, you're, not, if you're calling in 
we'll send them to you. Um, we can send them to you post. But if you're if you're on the online webinar, look in the little handouts panel, and you'll have a feeling drill. This is a really powerful tool that we use for all of our classes and our spaces. All right. So why why do we use it? First piece, as Black folks, as women, as queer folks and trans folks, we have been gaslit out of our emotions and a culture that has taught us that our feelings are not valid, our feelings do not matter as much as the rational mind, our feelings should be minimized, denied, pushed aside. We've received all those messages. This tool is a tool for reclamation of our power and our emotionality. It is a tool for us to engage every single day or uh, how we would like to, um, to, to really connect with the knowledge, the ancient, erotic, and powerful knowledge that is our feelings. Because all of us have that intuition, that gut. But a part of what happens in this culture that tells us that that's not valuable knowledge. And this is a tool that says that actually it is, and we're going to do that work of honoring it. So if you look at this wheel, you see in the core, there are some core feelings, sad, peaceful, and sad. And then as you see um, outside of the wheel, there's different iterations of those feelings, right? Different nuances of those feelings. Um, a part of our practice as we begin the work of reconnecting with our feelings, because many of us as Black folks, as survivors of trauma, as survivors broadly, have been disconnected from our feelings and our emotions. For many people who are raised and socialized as, um, as, as men, or just people who are socialized as Black folks, we've been taught to push down the feelings, to ignore them, right? And so, so, and so this, this, this tool is to like say, where does that, what do I feel? And also, where do I feel it in my body, right? Where is it coming up in my body? All of our feelings are information. They are not good or bad. You want to do a lot of things, but you don't want to should on your feelings. Because you should on your feelings, you start repressing. What you feel is the information that spirit, that life is giving to you. Honor that information to see what you need in your life, what you need, what, what, see what's being communicated around you. Whatever you ignore about your feelings, whatever you repress will return to you. Like my grandmother always says, what you bury in the backyard is going to show up on the front porch. So when Miss Millie from down the block show up on your front porch ready to cuss you out, that's because you buried it last year on the back porch and you act like nothing was going to happen, right? You know, they realize that it will show up some way. Right. So we're doing so a part of our work is to do the work of really being proactive about our emotional wellness and not just being the crisis folks that we as black people can't often be. We don't do nothing until it gets so bad. We're going to be proactive and actually start doing our emotional work today. So what I want to invite everyone to do in that chat box, a little question box. Thinking about we want to check in with us. What's coming up with us right now? How are we feeling? Folks are at home with the kids. Folks are, in, you know, like navigating a lot of different situations and scenarios. I want to invite everyone in that chat box to just not write out, write in the feeling. Well, I want to just, I don't, we don't feeling the story, not the narrative, but the feeling. And also, everyone want to share what you're feeling, but also where you're feeling in your body. Is it in your shoulders? Is it in your stomach? Is it in your thighs? Where do you feel it, right? So in that chat box, write in your um, feelings. It's a check-in for everybody. By how you're feeling, all feelings welcome, not just the happy, joy, joy feelings, because we have a lot of different emotions. Right? So let's um, take a moment to write those in. All right. And also, and just want really to make sure that we um, just want to also make sure that we we let people know that there may be emotions that you may be feeling that are not on this um, this feelings wheel, and mm -hmm. so those emotions are welcome as well. We want to make sure that we, we understand the difference between um, an emotion and what I consider to be a qualifier to an emotion. So words like I'm all right or I'm OK I'm good. or like anybody who goes into into Publix. I know out on the West Coast, y'all don't have Publix. Y'all got Ralph's. You go in there and the, and the cashier says, hey, did you find everything OK today? How are you feeling today? Well, my favorite go to is what? Oh, I'm feeling well, thank you. Well, it's not an emotion, okay? Mm. And mm. Um, so, so we want to take a look at emotions. Um, and like mm. we said before, some of the emotions that we may experience may not necessarily show up on this wheel, but you may have emotions that some of us may not be aware of. And so we 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 offer you the opportunity to to share that to share those emotions as well. I say, I say. Um, one, one other one I think about, Dion, is that um, a lot of times I see this meme circulating that people are saying that black folks, well, I'm good themselves into a depression. You know, just being like, I'm good, I'm good, <laughs> it's all good, I'm good. It's like, that's not really saying how you're feeling. Like, what's really going on there? You know, naming that is critical. 
So I love that right. you lift up that we don't do the qualifiers, but we actually get mm-hmm. to the heart of what we're feeling. Um, so we have a couple of folks who have um, started sharing some. So I'm going to read them out, and I'm going to read your name out. Um, so I have Leslie. Leslie says that Leslie's feeling confused and overwhelmed, and Leslie's feeling it in their chest. Um, chest is feeling tight. Um, Suwa is feeling scared. Angel feels empowered, optimistic, and concerned. Um, Charmaine is feeling hopeful. Tori is feeling um, like I'm constantly holding my breath. So that's interesting, Tori. I would wonder what that feeling word would be. You say you're feeling like you're constantly holding your breath. What would that feeling or emotion be? Um, I'd be curious to hear from you about that. Um, type that back in. Um, Rosemary says feeling sad, mad, scared, spectrum. I'm feeling the tension in my head, back, and shoulders. Uh, Christina's feeling frustrated. Um, Tafina is feeling tired, lower back and shoulders, feeling in that part of the body. Um, Warren is feeling thankful in my heart for the presentation. I love attending these webinars. Thank you all for this. Thank you, Warren. Kim says feeling tight in the shoulders and a bit anxious. Okay, so anxiety. Hopeful with underlying anger. It's multifaceted. Let me tell you, Kim, it is always multifaceted. That's real. That's real, very real. We have many feelings at one time. We can be feeling joyous, sad, frustrated, all those pieces. Thank you for bringing that in the room, Kim. Angel says, um, Angel's feeling critical. Kendall's feeling disoriented and overwhelmed and feeling it in the, in the Kendall's forehead and stomach. Um, Morgan is feeling hope, helpless and centered in uh, Morgan's chest. Uh, Chrissy's feeling anxious and hopeful. Yolanda's feeling joyful and um, Yolanda's heart and secure and full body. All right. Uh, Mephi's feeling excited and hopeful. Angel's frustrated. Christina's anxious. We've got a lot of people. Talking about the feelings, all right. Um, Phoenix is feeling isolated and irritated. Jay feels anxious, overwhelming, and in the shoulders and throat. I'm gonna do a couple more because we got a lot of people in here. <laughs> so I can't, you may not get to y'all, everyone, but I wanna make sure I get as many as possible. There's a lot of folks in the room. Um, Ashley is feeling overwhelmed and very tense in the abdomen, right? Erica is feeling relaxed in the arms and optimistic in the head, um, feeling in the head. and um, uh, Erica, so Samantha says, I don't see the chat option on my computer. Oh, the chat option is just your, um, the question the section, Samantha. So, you know, where you typed in is the place where you would type in. Um, but, um, er- Samantha says it's feeling irritated and frustrated, but, um, you have the right place to type in. So, one, I just want to just honor and name you all just sharing and naming feelings and just respecting and validating. Our work in this moment, it's just to honor and make space for these feelings, right? That all our feelings are valid. They are, they are legitimate. We don't have to explain them or justify them to anybody, not even to ourselves, right? We are feeling them. They are here. They are with us in the present. And within that present, there is information that we will grow and learn from those feelings. We don't need to, quote, unquote, fix a feeling, which is one of my pet peeves, because often when we say fix feelings, what it is about pushing people or moving them out of their feelings, uh, sometimes our work is just to create presence and honor and be witnesses for the emotions and feelings that we're having, right? Just honoring that they are valid. And it's breathing through them, feeling them in our bodies, and making time to process and move through them, right? I want to honor the people who talked about the body piece, right? So for a lot of Black folks particularly, we have higher degrees of somatization, right? And so for those who are not familiar with that term, somatization is like about the ways in which emotions show up in the body, right? So I know I have relatives who maybe they don't, um, maybe they have a physiological kind of ailment, a shoulder or fingers or hands that hurt. They go to the doctor, the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with your hand, there's nothing wrong with your shoulder. But then you talk to them a little bit longer and the shoulder pain is connected when it rains because the rain reminds me of the time maybe my sister or or relative um, passed away in a car accident or something happened that was hard, right? The body remembers and sometimes that pain is in our body. Our bodies are sending us messages every single day, sending you messages. Sometimes, and there's a whole practice people talk about, like how pain in the shoulders or stress in the shoulders might mean we're caring too much. People say that like the pain in the back means we're bent over backwards for other people. Our body is trying to say, hey, be present with me, attend to me. Maybe it's an opportunity for massage, for yoga, for stretching, getting up, taking a walk. Listen to the emotions that your body is telling you. Listen to what your feelings are telling you, right? This is a part of the practice. We give you this tool to take this beyond this workshop, to use it every single day or however you use, to share with your little ones in your life, start them off early, y'all, to share them with the elders in your life, to all the folks in your life 
to say, how do we create space for us to talk about our feelings and what's coming up for us? All right? So thank you for participating in that practice. Everyone who shared, for holding those feelings, for honoring those feelings, we will check in as we go forward as well. Last piece is just about managing discomfort. If you feel uncomfortable throughout the course of our work, we want you to take care of yourself. You're all over the country, all over the world, some folks in this room. So I want you to take some, make sure you're mindful that if you need to get up, get some water, if you need to take a twerk break, you know, Dion takes twerk breaks sometimes. We, do, we all need a twerk break sometimes. Do what you need to do, okay? <laughs> um, but also just reflecting if, it, if, it, if the discomfort is an opportunity for you to grow and how you can learn through that discomfort in those moments if you need to, all right? All right, and with that, I'm going to, um, y'all listen to me talk too much. Dr. Bates, come on and take it and um, take it from here. Awesome. Thank you, Yolo. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to start off our our conversation today about anxiety. And before we get too far into it, I'd just like to take some time and um, check in with you all and hear from a few people about um, what they think anxiety is. So. If you'd like to um, to type in your chat box, um, and, and and Yolo can read off a, a couple of responses from people about um, what anxiety means to you, what how you view anxiety. So, what is anxiety? Let's answer that question. Awesome. I'll give you all a few seconds to just get in there. Type that in your question box. Just answering what is anxiety. All right, so I got a couple of responses, Dion. I'm going to read them out, okay? So I see the first one is from Naisha. Naisha says um, that it's overly focused on the future rather than the present moment. Mm -hmm. Angel says it is the worst. That's the angel. Angel said it's just the worst. Um, Erica says it's intense worry with rapid thoughts. Um, Cora says it's a mixture of nervousness, uncertainty, and fear. Um, Samantha says it's an ongoing battle, overwhelming thoughts and worry and fear. Um, Jamika, Jamika says that it's waiting for th that thing to happen, that thing. Mm -hmm. Garrett says it's uncertainty about my purpose. Yolanda says it's fear taking over the response system. Um, Charmaine says being stuck in the automatic trauma response. All right, we got a lot of responses. I'm just going to read a couple more because we have a lot of folks responding. Um, so if I don't read yours, um, I'll just let you know we, 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 we're going to try to get to as many folks as we can. Morgan says racing thoughts, feeling keyed up in a state of tension. Tyrus says, anxiety is a buildup of energy that builds a discomfort in the body. And last but not least, Tafina says, it is a feeling of worthy, a worry, excuse me, worry and uncertainty. So those are just some of our responses we have about what anxiety is. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what if I told you that everybody is right? Anxiety is a combination of all those things, or it can be. Um, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, from the American Psychological Association, we have anxiety as defined as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. Um, some of the other physical ways in which anxiety can uh, manifest might be um, headaches. Um, you may, some people may have chest pain. Um, the National Alliance of Mental Health indicates that anxiety is the most common mental health issue in the country. With 40 million adults, that's 18% of the adults in this country who live with anxiety. Um, I like to say to people that anxiety is one of the first cousins of depression because sometimes their symptoms can look very similar. And oftentimes, individuals who experience anxiety, if the, the, the more prolonged the symptoms, the, the more likely they can kind of spiral into some sort of depressive episode, okay? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean a major depressive episode, but what it does mean is that there may be opportunity for them to experience symptoms that we may um, think of as being consistent with depression, so such as difficulty focusing or um, poor motivation or 
um, withdrawing from others. And we can talk a little bit more about those symptoms a little bit later. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. You know, Dion, one thing I'll add is that so for a lot of folks who may never have heard, a lot of folks may, maybe now we're talking more about mental health, but a lot of folks in our community maybe never hear the word anxiety, but we hear the word nerve. You know, me and Dion talk about this a lot. So, so like just thinking about that piece too, a lot of people say I got bad nerve, you mm -hmm. know. Um, mm -hmm. It's often just a way in which we are communicating that we're experiencing anxiety. So just holding that piece, we're going to talk more about that, but I want to hold that that's often a common use, a common term used in our community. Well, I think, you know, and, and I'm happy that you, you, you highlighted that because even when I think about when I was a kid um, and, and I would see some of my, my older relatives and, um, you know, they may, you know, kind of be kind of standoffish maybe. Um, and, and I'd be like, you know, well, you know, why is uncle such and such or why is aunt such and such, you know, why are they standoffish? Why are they yelling all the time? <laughs> you know, and, and, and my mom my mom, who is probably on this um, presentation. Hey, mama, I see. Hey, um, mama. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, she would say, well, you know, she, she, she's got some nerve problems or he's got some nerve problems, you know. And I think sometimes for us as adults, we try to make things easy for children to understand um, okay. while also not trying to overwhelm them with yep. um, words like anxiety. Um, and sometimes it may be to protect us from, you know, in terms of how we're feeling about having to explain this to our children. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I would add, too, like, you know, I love that you bring this piece in about, like, you know, like taking care of our young folks. But also, even acknowledging that, like, um, in the context of clinical interactions, I know we talked about this example before, um, De De Dion, is that um, – it's important that we honor the way in which our folks talk about mental health, right? And so the reality is like, you know, one of the, my pet peeves is I don't ever believe the racist slide that um, black people don't talk about mental health. We talk about mental health all the time. We just use our language to talk about mental health, right? And so like, you know, um, I've had examples where I've been working alongside psychologists or therapists and there's someone who comes in and says that I have bad nerves and the therapist is like, well, no, no that's, that's anxiety. And maybe that person isn't ready to accept that term or doesn't feel like that language really fits for their experience. And they're like, no, it's just nerve. And so our, our, part of our work is to honor that like, hey, we might be, have a different name for the same thing. And so we can, both of those can coexist. And I think that's really important. A lot of clinicians who won't have that kind of cultural awareness or cultural competence with black folks, they come in trying to push those terms that don't really, our community doesn't respond to. So we're really making sure we're focusing on, um, you know, treatment versus terminology. Like, you know, like, hey, you want to call it nerds, you can call it nerds. Are you going to come in here and get your support? That's what we need to be centralizing. Well, like, how do we do that piece? And so this name and that building on what you said, Deanna, that we have our own ways of talking about things, and anxiety is definitely one of them. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll talk a little bit later about how um, some of these symptoms show up within Black communities as well. Um, one of the things that we also want to look at in terms of, of anxiety is that a lot of times for individuals who are unaware of what anxiety looks like or how it can show up, um, they may confuse it with fear. And anxiety is not fear. When we think about fear, um, just like anxiety, fear is an emotional response. But fear, unlike anxiety, is an emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat. Okay, Anxiety typically tends to be in the future. Um, we're, we're concerned about something too far in the future. I always like to say, you know, when for a person who has anxiety, they're thinking too far ahead in the future. And for someone who is experiencing depression, we're stuck too far in, in the past. Um, but fear and anxiety are, they, they are very different. Um, anxiety tends to be more future oriented, oftentimes very vague, um, and it lasts typically longer than um, fear. Next slide. So one of the things about anxiety is that it typically will, um, will be experienced throughout the entire body. Um, and it can be experienced physically, psychologically, or behaviorally. Physically, symptoms may look like shortness of breath, sweating, upset stomach, um, nausea, sleep problems, loss of appetite, heart palpitations, shaking or trembling, fatigue, hot flashes or chills or dizziness. If you look at this, some of these same symptoms look somewhat like depression, okay? 
like I said, anxiety is depression's first cousin. Psychologically, anxiety can look like repetitive, obsessive, or intrusive thoughts. Um, so someone who may just have thoughts going and ruminating, okay? Um, negative self, uh, self-talk. self um, It can create lowered self-esteem, um, worry, fear, as well as feelings of detachment. Behaviorally, um, we think about checking and rechecking, pacing the floor, um, uh, inhibiting or decreased ability to act naturally, uh, difficulty concentrating or feeling motivated. Um, again, these are all symptoms of depression, of, uh, of anxiety, but they can also look like other kinds of conditions. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's really important that we're able to acknowledge and identify how we're feeling. Because when you look at some of these different symptoms, so like, for instance, pacing, you know, I might walk in the house and see someone pacing the floor and, you know, perhaps that person is feeling anxious because maybe they waiting for the numbers to come out because they went and they played the lottery and they hoping they're going to hit their million dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I could walk into somebody else's house and they're pacing back and forth because they're angry about something. Okay. Still pacing, but two different emotions. You have someone who's angry versus someone who is anxious. And so this is one of the reasons why it's really important to be able to acknowledge and identify the emotions that we are feeling, because qualifiers and behaviors can sometimes mean different things to different people. Okay. Absolutely. Can I add one thing, Dr. Bates? Um, you said it so brilliantly. I just want to uphold and lift that physical piece, too. I definitely, like, had the experience of just, like, working with folks in the past and talking about, you know, like, people saying that I don't really have anxiety, but I don't sleep well. And we're like, okay, well, like, you know, making sure we make that connection, because sometimes it's a disconnection, right? People don't right. think that, like, because it's showing up physically, maybe you go into the doctor for, you know, um, upset stomach, you feel like you're having some gastrointestinal distress. And then the physician is like, I, I don't see anything, you know, that's showing up when I'm doing the blood work. This might be actually a symptom of anxiety, right? Like showing up pieces too. So really being mindful that um, our bodies, once again, are such critical information tools for us in our lives. And that like um, how our behavior is changing, what we're doing, our behavior is telling us a lot about where we are. You know, um, our behavior is telling us a lot about how we are in relationship to things. You know, sometimes we're like, um, I think um, uh, one of our webinars recently, we we're talking about procrastination. And like how that sometimes can show up in anxiety too, right? Like, you know, like I don't, I'm avoiding this because I have a lot of feelings and anxiety, anxiousness around it, right? So really checking in with, pay attention, what are behaviors telling us about our feelings sometimes as well too? Because we might say we feel one way, but then our behaviors are showing like, well, maybe you actually are somewhere else. You like, like really checking in with how we're showing up is really important. Right. And, and, and before we move on to the next slide, I also want to um, just kind of go back, circle back around to um, the, the, our doctors. Um, I am a proponent that you need to, if, one, if you don't have a general practitioner, you know, try to get one. I know that there are some people who may have limited resources. They may have limited financial resources. Um, and, and not be able to see a, um, a, a physician regularly. But sometimes, you know, we have to rule out physical things um, just to make sure that it's nothing physical. So when you think about shortness of breath or you think about sweating or you think about nausea, some of these symptoms can, can be um, symptomatic of a medical condition, okay? And so one of the things that we really want to do is make sure that we're ruling out any kind of medical condition um, mm -hmm. that may look like this so that, so that we make sure that you are healthy medically. And then if, like Yolo said, the doctor says, hey, we've done all these tests, we can't find anything that's medical, then we may need to look at, okay, what's going on with you emotionally? What's going on with you mentally? What's going on? What kinds of stressors do you have going on? Um, in, in, in your environment that may be contributing to some of these um, symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So panic attacks. So panic attacks and anxiety. Pa a panic attack is a type of anxiety, 
okay? Just because a person experiences anxiety does not mean that they experience panic attacks. Um, oftentimes, um, with panic attacks, we may see individuals experience symptoms such as um, pounding heart or accelerated heart rate, chest pain or discomfort, um, sweating or heat sensations or chills, trembling or shaking, numbness or tingling, um, nausea or abdominal distress, shortness of breath. Seems a whole lot like anxiety, doesn't it? Um, feelings of choking, fear of dying, fear of losing control or going crazy, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, um, derealization or depersonalization. The difference between a panic attack and anxiety is that typically with panic attacks, they come on very suddenly and they also involve intense, overwhelming fear. And so when you think about derealization or depersonalization, this is kind of when someone may be in the midst of a panic attack and they start to feel detached either from themselves, so detached from their thought processes, detached from their surroundings. Um, you, you may have um, maybe ex saw a person experience a panic attack, and when, when, when you go to them and you say, yeah, it seemed like you were having a panic attack, and they say, well, you know, I, 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 I really don't remember that. You know, I, I just felt like, you know, I was on the outside of myself, and I don't remember anything else. I just saw myself looking at myself that could be um, consistent with a panic attack, okay? Next slide, please. So in terms of navigating panic attacks, we wanted to highlight some tips for supporting someone during a panic attack. And um, one of the things that we, I, I'm gonna start at the bottom because I think that these things are, are really important one of the things that we never really want to do for somebody who is having a panic attack is yell at them to calm down because that ain't going to do nothing but make them just get more and more anxious, okay? Um, we don't want to ignore their panic attack uh, or judge them or belittle them for having an anxiety attack or a panic attack, okay? And then we also don't want to rush at them quickly or smother them. We always want to ask for consent if possible. In all things, when we are um, trying to support someone, we want to make sure that we ask for their consent. Now, sometimes the person may not necessarily be able to give their consent. And so with something like that, it may be that you have to make a judgment call and reach out to um, emergency personnel. So you may, it may be you have to call 911. And sometimes, you know, with panic attacks, as we've looked at from the symptoms, they can look like, you know, other medical conditions, right? And so we may not be able to tell whether this person is having a panic attack or if they have some other underlying medical condition, because they may not be able to tell us, right? And so if that's the case, we want to encourage you to reach out quickly to um, an, em an, an emergency response team first, okay, because we don't know what's going on with the person. And then while we're waiting for, for, for that, emo, that emergency response team to make it to us, we want to be able to do the following things. Um, if possible, ask the person if they know what is happening. Like we said, they may know, they may not know. This may be a person who um, has a history of anxiety, and they may be able to tell you, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm having a panic attack right now. We also need to be mindful that panic attacks can look like heart attacks and other respiratory distress. You know, and particularly now with the COVID-19, um, we have a lot of people who are going into respiratory distress, um, and not just even with COVID-19, but we're still in the midst of flu season. We're still in the midst of where, where uh, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of my clients have been suffering with bronchitis. Um, so it's really, really important to be mindful that sometimes panic attacks can look like other types of um, medical conditions that can also impact a person's ability to breathe, okay? We wanna be also be able to help them breathe deeply in a calm, even tone, if possible. Um, practicing deep breathing can help them to calm down. And we're gonna give everyone the opportunity to, to practice that a little bit later in this presentation. Um, if you are, um, if there's a large group of people around, have people to back up and give the person space. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but when there's a large group of people, it's oftentimes 
much hotter than it would be if there were just a few people and it can be a little more difficult to breathe. So you want to have the group to kind of disperse and have them to back up so that that person can have a little bit more room so that it's a little easier for them to breathe. Um, if possible, have them lean back against a wall while seated or standing. Um, this can help the person to feel grounded. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about also a little bit later is, um, is, is, is what we can do to help people feel grounded um, in the midst of anxiety. Um, we also want to encourage them to sit tall. So to, to, if, if at all possible, to sit up straight um, because that too can help to open up the airways and the air passages to help them breathe a little bit easier, okay? And then the other thing, and this is probably one of the most important things that we could do to support someone who's having a panic attack, particularly if we're waiting for um, an emergency response team to show up, and that's to just sit with them. Um, to just sit, you may you you don't have to talk to them, you don't have to say anything to them. For a lot of people, it's just a matter of just having someone waiting with them that may even help them to to calm down and to feel more comfortable. Okay. You know, um, you do this so well. Um, and I just you know I I love we love I love this graphic that we created together. Um, one 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 really great example I think of um I see in the media in terms of navigating panic attacks is I've watched This Is Us with Randall. Yeah. And I mean, Randall yeah. has panic attacks. And, and every time that I've seen the show, the way in which his family responds to him actually follows a lot of these pieces, right? Like I've seen like, you know, him and his brother, his brother encourages him to sit, sit back and like make sure he sit up tall. He breathes with them. Sometimes he'll hold his hand and take deep breaths with them. They'll clear out the space. And so like just seeing, just giving you kind of a real life, well, not real life, but like at least a media example of how to support someone who might be in that kind of in a panic attack moment. And that's just a really good example if anybody's ever seen This Is Us um, um, that show. So yeah. You ready for the next slide, Dion? Oh, Dion, you still there? I'm still here. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay. I'll see you. Okay, okay, just make sure. Okay. So when does anxiety become a disorder? So anxiety becomes a disorder um, very simply when it becomes disruptive to our day-to-day -day living. So when it becomes too intense or too severe, when it starts to last too long, okay? And then also when it impairs our day-to-day -day functioning. So when anxiety starts getting in the way of our ability to be able to, um, to socialize with people and it interferes with our interpersonal skills, um, when it interferes with our ability to be able to stay on top of our academics if you're in school um, or, or even interferes with our job, being able to get to our job or being able to focus on our job or do our job. This is when anxiety becomes a disorder. Um, some of the common anxiety disorders uh, include post-traumatic stress disorder or, or PTSD, social anxiety disorder, sometimes we call it SAD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, which sometimes we call GAD for short. And then there are specific phobias. So there's like agoraphobia, where a person may have um, fear of leaving their home. Um, there might be, if you're anything like me, you may have a fear of snakes. Um, some people are afraid of heights. So there are some specific phobias. Um, Test anxiety is a specific kind of phobia. You can you do well studying, you can do all right with everything, but when you get to the test, you just freeze. Um, so there are a lot of different types of specific phobias. I think the other thing that's really important is that just because you have anxiety, it does not mean that it is a disorder. And that is something that is really, really important because just like with depression, if we go back to that feelings wheel, that we showed you previously, just like with depression or excitement or boredom or anxiety or peace or anger, these feelings can sometimes be very appropriate, okay? And that's important for us to understand. Sometimes you will have what we call appropriate anxiety, okay? Um, one of the things that we also want to talk about is useful anxiety. And this is anxiety when um, 
that is that that helps us to redirect our behavior to avoid harm. Um, when we're called upon to perform well, it can help us to focus and achieve our goals. It can also help us to change our perspective about things. So what do we mean by that? So when we're able to um, view a stressful situation as more of a challenge as opposed to a threat, it can help to motivate us to um, improve our performance. And then also there are some studies that have shown that experiencing anxiety can help um, improve um, our empathy for others. So basically what that says is that you know, if we've gone through some anxiety before and we've been able to kind of overcome that anxiety, we can be more encouraging and more understanding to other people when they're experiencing anxiety, okay, based upon our own previous experience. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the possible causes of anxiety, and as you can see, there are many here. Um, I think it's important that we highlight that you know, it's really difficult to know 100% where anxiety comes from. Um, and so I think another thing that's important is that we don't get so stuck in trying to figure out, you know, if, if you have anxiety, how did you get it? But we do want to talk a little bit about some of the possible causes. Um, so genetics and other biological causes. Um, so Science says that if you have the same genes as someone who has anxiety, you may be twice the risk of, of having it yourself. Excuse me. Doesn't mean that you will have anxiety, but what it does mean is that you have been predisposed to possibly having anxiety. Also, there are certain medical conditions that um, can cause anxiety. So conditions like hyperthyroidism, um, a lot of times when um, I, I have clients who have depression or they have anxiety, um, one of the first things I'll ask is, okay, have you had your thyroid checked? Because if your thyroid is operating too low, it can cause what we call hypothyroidism, which can cause depression or depressive symptoms. And if it's operating too high, it can cause anxiety um, or hyperthyroidism. So this is another um cause of anxiety. Another cause of anxiety you know, the, that, hmm? go ahead. You know, and Dion, um, just lifting up, I wanted to just kind of add to the piece you talked about with the genetics, because it speaks also to one conversation we've had, um, we and Dion, Dion did a webinar recently um, a while back on intergenerational trauma, right? And so thinking also about like, you know, the, there are many people who are as clinicians or practitioners or spiritual folks who would say that like, sometimes like when someone's experienced, like we say a traumatic experience, they just maybe created some anxiety, that that anxiety, when it's not navigated or held, can be passed on through many um, different generations, right? So thinking about how people frame that is really important. And genetics is one way to frame that as being framed. And also I think that like it's so important to name that like when we talk about these genetics and we talk about these pieces that we hold that um, we're kind of in this really curious moment where sometimes these things are being used to justify um, harm against our communities, right? Where they're like saying, oh, black people are more predisposed to certain things as opposed to really acknowledging the onus on the systems and the structures and the historical causation, right? And so just really holding that we have to like, we navigate these things and acknowledge that like there is some evidence here, but it's about how we contextualize and understand them. Who is actually, where is, where is the onus? The onus is not on black folks. The onus is on the systems that perpetuate the harm, that creates the anxiety, the distress and all these pieces. We just want to uplift right. that and just round that out with their piece. That piece is critical. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um... Definitely. Thank you. Um, thank you for highlighting that. Um, you know, we also, when we think about anxiety, a lot of times we may hear the term um, uh, a um, some sort of chemical imbalance. And basically all that means is that all of us have serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamines in our brains. Okay. And sometimes these neurotransmitters can misfire, they can dysfunction. And sometimes that happens as a result of, um, you know, a poor diet, um, kind of like what Yolo was talking about with regards to um, um, calling it um, epigenetics with, with the intergenerational trauma. Um, it can be um, prolonged expo exposure to stress, um, hormone changes. 
Um, it can also, this can also happen as a result of um, metabolic or um, digestive issues um, in terms of how our food is broken down and absorbed in the bloodstream um, in terms of helping these neurotransmitters to, to build up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm looking at the time now and, and we're running just a little bit behind, mm -hmm. so I'm going to run through these a little quickly. Um, other possible causes of anxiety, um, family environment or childhood experiences. So being raised in a perfectionistic or critical environment, um, experiencing emotional insecurity, experiencing um, physical or mental or sexual abuse, um, being raised in an environment um, with parents who may have um, abused or been dependent on substances. Um, all of these things can contribute to anxiety in terms of the environment that, that you grew up in. We all come from a culture, and um, sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes what happens is that a, a, a parent's belief in, in terms of the world not being safe can be transmitted onto their children through their own um, anxiety-motivated behavior. A perfect example, when I was a kid growing up, um, and I would say to my mom, mom, I'm going, I'm going next door to the neighbor's house to play. And she would yeah, okay, go ahead and play. And well, she, my mom knew all of my friends and she knew how to get in contact with all of their parents. And so if she called over to the house and we weren't there, <clears throat> excuse me, then it would cause her to get really anxious. And then she would call my friends to try to find out where I am. And then when I got home, I'd go, she would go through 20 questions. Well, where have you been? I thought you said you were going next door. And she would be a little irritated with me. And I'm like, well, I did go next door. But you know, as kids, especially in the summertime, you go to one friend's house, you get on your bike, and then you go to somebody else's house, and then they get their bike, and then you go to somebody else's house. And as I got older, and I realized, okay, you know, my mom went through some pretty traumatic experiences. You know, in college, her father went missing. Later on, her brother went missing. And as I got older and I began to understand, you know, going through that kind of tra trauma also impacted her anxiety. And she used to say to me, you know, I really don't care where you go as long as you just let me know you're going there. And I used to say to myself, okay, well, if you don't care where I'm going, then why in the world do, you, do I have to just stop and let you know? You know, you know I'm coming home. But her thing was always, you know, I need to know where you're going because if something happens to you, I need to be able to have a starting place to come looking for you. And that did not really resonate with me until I got a little bit older and a little bit more mature. So sometimes um, childhood experiences can create anxiety that we actually pass on um, to our uh, to our children. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Specific events or stressors. Um, so like witnessing or di or directly experiencing a traumatic event um, may also activate a person's anxiety. OK, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we've got going on, you know, police brutality, sexual assault, um, homophobic and transphobic um, actions. Um, actions against um, LGBT individuals, um, actions or, or violence against um, black and brown people or, or, or religious trauma. So going, going to church and being told you're going to hell or going to church and God forbid you were violated sexually or emotionally or physically in the church. All of these things can cause um, trauma for individuals and can also mm -hmm. create um, anxiety when it comes down to revisiting some of these things. Um, and so, and so Dean, I, I, I'm grateful that we're talking about this because like, clearly like you're holding all these pieces that are you know, pre even COVID, right? Like pre COVID, this is the reality. And when we think about right. the realities of black communities, of black women, of black queer folks, and black trans folks who are navigating all of these things, these systems and structures that are creating distress. So now right. we're seeing, of course, our communities being in a heightened state of distress, right? We've seen COVID 19. Um, impact disproportionately black and brown communities, not because of anything that, that black and black people are doing, but because of systems and historical inequality, right? right? And like an historical economic issue. And so it's really um, important to understand, I think, Dion, we, and you said this before, and some of the other work we do a lot is that, you know, we are, many of our communities are already in face of distress and high anxiety. So now we're seeing that increase. 
due to this yeah. current kind of moment um, that is creating more distress for us. And of course, the reality of what it means to be in a global pandemic is an anxiety inducing reality, right? It creates anxiety for us because um, things may feel unsure, et cetera, et cetera. So just holding and lifting that piece up, um, Dion. And, and, you, and you are right, um, I'm acknowledging the time too, because we're at 12 or eight, so I'm gonna go ahead and yeah. take us to the next slide. Um, all righty. Um, oh, wait, did we skip something? Okay, let's, uh, uh, we, okay. So so one of the things that we talked about, um, Yolo highlighted this a little bit earlier in the presentation with regards to how for um, communities of color, it isn't that we've never talked about mental health. We've just, um, it's just looked different. Okay. And so we want to also look at how anxiety shows up in black and queer communities. Sometimes it can show up as hypervigilance or avoidance. Um, one of the things, particularly in queer communities, um, there is a lot of focus on image, okay? And sometimes what happens is, you know, when we get so caught up on image, it can cause us to avoid um, being in spaces with other people or um, or cause us anxiety when we do go into spaces with other people because we're so concerned. It, it we can sometimes be very image driven. Um, within within Black communities, a lot of times you won't hear that a person is feeling worried or or that they're feeling anxious. But you may, like Yolo said, you may hear them talk about, oh yeah, my neck is hurting or my shoulders are hurting. Even in, even in terms of myself, I always know when I get anxious because I can feel the tension in my neck, my shoulders, and I have a sciatic nerve problem, and, and that will always start to creep in. Like I tell people, I can tell you when it's raining long before the weatherman will tell you that it's raining, okay? Um, so we have the somatic complaints. Sometimes it may show up as anger or rage. So again, going back to that feelings wheel, um, if, if, if somebody says, you know, yeah, I'm feel I'm feeling bothered right now. And, you know, bothered can look a lot of different ways. For some people, bothered might look like, okay, maybe they're feeling sad. But for some people, bothered might be maybe they're feeling angry. Maybe, you know, they're 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 it's coming out as anger or it's coming out as rage. It's coming out as some sort of explosive behavior. Um, a lot of times, particularly with our black men, we socialize them to either be angry. And that's it, right? So, um, so sometimes anxiety can come out um, and look other ways. And if you're not really aware of how you're feeling, if you're not really aware of how this is showing up in your body, you may say, oh, yeah, I'm angry. But in all actuality, once we start going through, okay, well, you know, are you worried about something? Well, yeah, I do feel worried from time to time. Okay, are you having problems sleeping? Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm having some problems sleeping. Seems like I, I I just wake up and I pace the floor. Well, maybe you're not angry. Maybe you're feeling anxious. Okay, uh -huh. so that's important to understand. Um, it can also look like a commitment to control um, the environment of others, overuse of food or substances. And you know, in our communities, hey, we use food for a lot of things. We use food when we're happy. We use food when we're sad. We use food when we're bored. We use food when we want to gossip about folks. So it can look like, you know, it can look like overuse of substances or food. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to be aware. We're talking about awareness. We're talking about recognizing. We're talking about acknowledging our feelings and being in tune with our feelings. Um, they're, they're, and th go ahead. No, I'm gonna say now. I'm so glad you lifted that up because, like, a part of our work in our communities at this critical moment is because we can't do a we we can't we can't stop the crisis that's currently happening. We don't have to. A lot of us don't have the power to do that, but we need to be vigilant and mindful about what's how it's impacting people we love and we care about, so we can bring it to their awareness, right? And so we can support folks as we can. So that being able to think about like how is it showing up with my cousin, my mother, my partner, myself, these pieces. And then, like, well, we're going to show a little diagram later, talk about, like, what are some strategies we can do to kind of have help um, reduce our anxiety or manage our anxiety is really, really critical. Um, yeah. Right. So and we're I, at 12-12, and and we and too. Yeah, and I know we got to move on, but, but yeah, being able to to acknowledge and, 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 and see what's going on, because what's happening now with this COVID, 
unlike some of the other crises that we've experienced in this country, is that many of us are stuck at home with our folks all day, every day. Okay, and that's bringing a whole different set of concerns. Okay, next slide. So, how do we be present? How do we be present while black? So, we want to talk about being present, and basically, what we're talking about is being in the here and now, as we talked about previously. When we think about depression, oftentimes we think about being too far back in the past. And when we think about anxiety, we think about being too far in the future. Anxiety is a condition that's extremely future-oriented. And one of the ways that we look at coping with anxiety is learning how to be in the present, learning how to be in the here and now. And basically, all that means is being aware and mindful of what is happening in this very moment. You know, we've mentioned being aware. We've mentioned acknowledging several times throughout this presentation. But if we can learn how to be in the here and now, that can help fight anxiety. It can help cut down on worry and ruminating. So when your thoughts just keep going and going and going, and it can also keep you grounded and connected to yourself and your surroundings. Research has shown that learning to be in the here and now can also help to reduce stress. It can increase happiness and improve the ability to cope with emotions that we might consider negative, like fear and anger. Okay. Soothing versus nurturing. We want to talk about that a little bit because that's something that a lot of times I don't think we talk about enough. Um, there's a lot of, particularly in counseling, um, there are a lot of techniques that involve soothing, and I, I've, I've, I've kind of revolted against that word because I think that, yes, where soothing can be very helpful, I think we have to look at what it is we're soothing. And so we want to talk a little bit about the difference between soothing and nurturing. When we think about soothing, we're, talk, we're, we're, we're thinking about our emotions. This is all emotion-centered. So are we minimally conscious of our emotions or are we aware of our emotions? We cannot nurture ourselves if we are not aware of what's going on with us emotionally. Okay. So the question is, how are you feeling emotionally? And being able to articulate that and be aware of that. Because when we're not aware of our emotions, what happens is that it's extremely easy for us to um, navigate different situations very emotionally detached, very uh, being very unconsciously emotional and, and, and unconsciously detaching. Um, one of the one of the um, examples that I typically use is that, you know, if I go home today and I go to the freezer and I pull out some Ben and Jerry's ice cream and I got a whole gallon and then I decide I'm going to sit down and I start eating it and I'm watching the, um, the the Housewives of Atlanta and I'm just sitting there and I'm eating it and I'm eating it and I'm eating it and I'm eating it. And then I look down and I notice that it's all gone. What's going to happen? Number one, I'm going to probably feel guilt. I'm going to also feel shame. Okay. Not only will I feel guilty, but I will also feel shame, okay? And this will negatively impact um, my own perception of myself as well as my self-worth, okay? And that's really important because I think a lot of times what happens is that when we, when we are detached and, and we experience those emotions that are, for many of us, are really challenging, like feeling sad or feeling disappointed or feeling angry about something, um, you know, you got to understand that those are emotions too, just like the happy and the joyous. We are emotional beings. And so we have the capacity to feel all these different emotions. Never are we going to be happy and glad and and satisfied all the time. The other piece is we're not going to always feel sad and angry and disappointed all the time either. But it's important that we're able to highlight and acknowledge when we're feeling what 
because that will give us a lot of information about how we navigate certain situations. It will give us a lot of information about what we need in that time, in that period of time, and it will give us information that we can pass on to other people in terms of, you know, what we need from them during that moment. Okay. Um, another thing that I typically talk to people about is, you know, I live here in Atlanta. I hate traffic. The thing that I hate more than traffic is getting up in the cold and the rain and, and, and it's dark and I have to go to work. So if it's cold, it's raining, it's dark, and there's traffic on 285, that's um, that's like a parking lot, although I don't have to worry about that now thanks to COVID. But but um, if, if that's the case and I am up and I'm already feeling annoyed over the fact that it's cold and it's raining outside and it's dark and I have to get up to go to work, then by the time I get to work, I'm probably going to be a little gremlin. And so if I just stop and take a little time to become aware of how I'm ex of, of how I'm feeling, then I can disconnect. So in other words, I can go into my job and I can say to people, hey, listen, I need a little time. Give me about five minutes to just take some time away from everyone so that I can sit down, so that I can breathe, so that I can do some things that are going to be healing for me, do some things that are going to um, be nourishing to me, so that when I go into this meeting, I'm not being a gremlin to everybody, right? And this can help to improve not only uh, mastery of my self-worth, but also restore my mental energy uh, um, so that I can um, have the space and the energy that I need to deal with whatever those emotions were um, prior to me going, in, going into that meeting. I need you all to understand that when we disconnect, it doesn't mean that we are pushing those feelings aside. It doesn't mean that we're not going to deal with those feelings. What it says is that, you know what, I am aware of what's happening to me right now. I'm aware of how I'm feeling. And so that I don't get stuck in this, let me do something that's going to be healing for myself. Let me do something that's going to uplift my self-worth or my self-concept. I know that I have to go back to this emotion and deal with it. But right now, let me do something that is going to really re-energize me and restore me so that I have the energy to deal with it. It might be taking some time away and then coming back and thinking about, okay, who is in my wellness system who can help me through this? Okay, this is what we call being proactive. Okay, next slide. I also want to make sure I add that um, for folks, this is also a graphic that is available in your handout. So we want to invite you to download it to continue your own kind of journey exploring your relationship to soothing and nurturing. Um, yeah, and I can do this one. I've even talking like I can handle this piece and some. I know we talked about it. Um, so this is another tool that we have in your handout sheet which is just some common coping strategies, right? And so I think that what I love the examples that Dion gives, when we talk about soothing and we talk about nurturing and these different coping strategies, we're holding that we need a variety of different coping strategies in our belt, in our kind of like tool belt. Um, it is really important to be mindful of like, you know, our relationship to our coping strategies, right? Because then it becomes a problem when we start over relying on one or it becomes an unhealthy or unproductive, useful relationship with that coping strategy. So here's some just like, like a tool that's gonna kind of begin to like the self-assessment, like, so there's that coping, there's mindfulness, right? So mindfulness is activities that are going to bring me into the present, right? They help me ground me in my body, bring me into my body, meditation, prayer, yoga, tai chi, breathing exercise. They help bring me into the moment. Another common coping strategy is that we might redirect, and a lot of folks are doing this now, right? So say you're in the house with your family. Maybe you're all playing video games together as a way to disconnect. Maybe you have some art projects that you're doing, some cooking together. Maybe you're reading a book together or you're learning a new skill. Collaboratively, those are the coping strategies to help well, communities and families that are navigating this piece, right? Other practices, emotional awareness, right? Activities that give us emotional catharsis and connection. So the feelings world is one, right? It's connecting me to my feelings. I'm naming and expressing my feelings. So that's a catharsis. I'm getting it out, right? I'm expressing it. Maybe journaling or coloring. These are all strategies that we can use. Um, nurturing and soothing at the bottom. So we have nurturing. Activities that nourish and enrich our body, spirit, and self-esteem, right? Things that uplift me. So building off of what Dion was sharing, these could be affirmations, massage, Reiki, aromatherapy, a variety of different things. Um, and then soothing, right? Activities that nurse our feelings, temporarily relieve discomfort, but we have to be mindful because it can sometimes become compulsive or excessive. So we want to be mindful. So like, you know, I would tell this, and Dion going to talk about me. There's some days that like, you know, I might come home and eat that pint of ice cream or two, right? We're not knocking that as a coping strategy. 
the question that becomes that we have to be mindful of is that I'm not, if I'm eating that pine ice cream every single day of the week to food, then that becomes a challenge, right? So like being mindful of what coping strategies we're using and how much we're using them is really critical because um it's it's it, we're just all navigating so many things right now. It has other consequences. Like if I'm lactose intolerant, I'm eating a pint of ice cream. That's a problem. It's gonna create some other distress for myself and whoever's in my quarantine quarters because you know you're passing gas, you're doing all kinds of things, right? You know you don't want that situation, right? Um, and then community care planning, right? So planning and mapping out self, family, and community needs. Like really making a plan with your family about like you know how what's our quiet time? What is the time our boundaries? How are we going to navigate being in these small quarters together? How am I going to navigate being maybe in a quarter by myself? What does that look like? These are just common coping strategies that we want to consider in our plethora of, um, in our tool belt of, of, of things that we can do. So looking at them as a way to share with other folks and say like, hey, what, which one of these can we do? How can we bring these into our lives? But also looking at how you are already doing them and how you can refine and uplift them in your own work. So great tool um, that we download, we invite you to download. And it's great. It's also like, you know, very young people friendly too, right? You can talk to kids about it, talk to your folks and like, hey, let's do these pieces today. Maybe we have one day we have meditation together. It's an opportunity to practice these things as we're grappling with the kind of other crises that we can't manage as well right now, you know? Um, Slipping that up. Um, like I said, make it a family affair. I'm just noticing Dion, we're at 1224, so I'm going to make sure I just kind of power us through these pieces, but like, um, you know, Dion was saying earlier, we're all in folks, some of a lot of us are in spaces with family and community. Bring our families into it, right? To make these practices, so these anxiety reduction practices don't need to be like an isolated. Sometimes you might need something that's only for us, like it might be a journaling. Maybe you journal solo. Maybe you do journaling activities with your folks. Maybe y'all do dance. Like, you know, Debbie Allen had a thing when she did a dance camp online. So I saw families doing that, right? So making it a family affair to navigate your anxiety and like support you all it's a really great way to kind of build accountability around it. I've been doing a yoga challenge with two of my friends, right? So we, even though we're all in different places, we have an online class we take and we take it every day and that's been really super helpful to help hold me accountable, but it's helped let, like, help me manage my anxiety better because you know, before then I was just like, you know, spinning and spiraling, right? So really make it a community affair. We are communal folks, bring folks in, even if they're across the way, how do we rope them in? How do we stay connected? Um, one, 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 one thing one thing that I do want to go yeah. back if you would go back one mm -hmm. I, I I want yeah. to um not that one the um, the family okay. oh family okay. Okay. Yeah. so 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 one thing that I do want to um make sure that I highlight is that many of us are stuck in the house with our family all day long that's not something that many of us are used to because we're used to being able to get up and go to work we send the kids off to school or we send them off to aftercare or the extracurricular activities or your partner may have the kids and you're off or you may have the kids and your partner's off. One thing that's important during this time, if you're finding that people are beginning to get a little bit more irate um, and more restless, some of that may be anxiety, but this is appropriate anxiety. When you're not used to being in the house with each other all the time, Yes, it can create a lot of anxiety. And so one of the things that you may want to take some time to think about is who in your family is an extrovert and who in your family is an introvert? Because your introverts are probably going to have a little bit more difficulty with being around people so much all the time, okay? And I think this is a really great time to just really sit down with everybody and talk about, hey, what are your needs right now? Maybe it would be a matter of, well, you know what? We'll designate a room for, for everyone and, and we can, we can um, schedule time for people to go in this room. It might be that they go in the room to play a video game by themselves. It might be that they go in and have some time to read a book by themselves. It might be that you know, a couple of people go in and they play a game. But if you can schedule some time for people that may give them some uh, some time away from the rest of the family, whether it's in a room, whether you have a balcony or a, or a patio or something of that nature, just so that, you know, people can at least try to feel as if they're getting time for themselves. Having time for yourself, you still need that even during this time, but you may have to be a little bit more creative and definitely more deliberate about how you go about navigating that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dion. 
So we're looking at the time. We know we're at 1225, but we want to make sure we have some space for questions. So, Dion, I can commit to another 10, 15 minutes and stay on and off, and if, that, if that will work for you, just so we can see if folks have any questions. And we can unmute you. Um, and then you said, sure, that's what I heard you say. Is that okay for you, Dion? Yeah. 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 And so um, if you have a question, you can post it in the chat box, question box, or if you would like to, you can also, like, um, just raise your hand on the little um, – Go to webinar fees because we want to make sure we have some time to talk. We know we brought a lot of information. Our hope was to really give you a lot of tools. We probably recognize a lot of things you're already doing, but we want to make sure that we're also like being supportive and responsive. So we just want to take a couple of moments to um just kind of check in with folks. What are you, what um what's coming up for you? What are you thinking? Um, I have a first question from Brittany. So Brittany says, when we feel a negative thought coming into our heads, what is a good strategy for redirecting that thought? Um, is it chanting our affirmations? I might randomly blurt out, I hate my job throughout the day. How do I stop? Um, Gia, you want to take that one on? Okay, so what I got was when I have a negative thought, how do I stop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's, uh, Brittany, Brittany says, um, how I'm, I randomly blurt out, I might randomly blurt out, I hate my job throughout the day. How do I stop blurting that out? How do I um, stop the negative thoughts? And what are some good strategies to help redirect those thoughts? So first of all, what I would say is, um, do you hate your job? Um, if you do, and you're blurring out, I hate my job, um, I'm not necessarily going to um, suggest that you, you, you stop doing that. I, I think that, you know, sometimes we need to have permission to be able to say things that, you know, we, we may not feel comfortable saying around saying to other people. Now, if you're going to your job and you're telling your boss that you hate your job, that's a whole different conversation we need to be having. But if you're saying, you know, I hate my job and this is something that 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 you're really struggling with, well, number one, I think that you should have permission to have those feelings. But then on the other end of that, I'm also curious about how is that feeling motivating you to do something different? It might mean looking for a different job. It might mean, okay, when I go to work, I'm here at my job, but when I leave my job, I'm going to leave the job here and I'm going to disconnect. So you're aware, I, 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 I have feelings of hate for my job. Let me disconnect and let me go and do something that's going to be nurturing, do something that's going to be healing for me. And so whatever that is, something that helps to, something that helps to foster your self-worth. And that might be, you know, maybe you're really, really good at, I don't know, cooking. Maybe you're really, really good at painting. Um, maybe you're really, really good at, at doing whatever. Uh, maybe you're really, really good at, at, at designing clothes. Maybe you're really, really good at doing makeup. And so you, you, um, you have friends who, who you can call, hey, girl, let me do your makeup. Or, you know what, let me start working on my, on my clothing line or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, next question I have for Christina. Christina says, how do we deal with work anxiety? Performance, communication, addressing toxic relationships. Um, let me tell you, I'll take this one on. Um, we have a whole arm of our work, and Dion does a lot of this work with me, where we do a lot of organizational wellness. I would say that, like, you know, even as an organization being, we have been navigating this as well. Like, one of the things I think that's really critical and that I've been really um, em um, emphasizing with the team is understanding this is not business as usual. And like, it's really, it really kind of goes into leadership, right? Like, you know, um, a piece of it we've been doing is like really kind of adjusting our work schedule and expectations around this pandemic because the anxiety that we are all experiencing and also the nature of our work is contributing to us not being able to show up in the way we would show up if outside of this kind of circumstance, right? So I think that's really important to kind of build that. Um, in terms of communication, addressing toxic work relationships, there's a lot of pieces to that. We have a whole emotionally intelligent leadership training that we do around teaching people about communication styles. A lot of us have learned communication styles from, from our families and communities, and those communication styles are what we know, but they're not necessarily what would help us get our needs met. And oftentimes I say that those, um, those communication styles often show up in other group dynamics, work being one of them. And so there's a lot in those pieces, Christina, we could definitely unpack, um, talk about. I would definitely want to um, invite you to stay on, um, join on the list if you're not on already. We're actually going to be doing an emotional intelligent leadership training um, during the COVID-19 crisis um, training. So talking about these nuances and some tools and strategies to support managers, employees, and staff to navigate that. So um, thank you for lifting that. It is an ongoing practice. Um, and a lot of those things on the chart 
really kind of irrelevant to it as well. Like, you know, even from working from home, um, some of those pieces are really critical. So, yeah, we can talk more about it. Christian, give everyone e email contact and go more in depth with that piece. Um, next question I have is Ty from Tyrese, who corrected me about saying your name correctly. Thank you, Tyrese. Um, for, um, for you, Dion, Tyrese says, um, with family, my family is suffering from a lot of anxiety. We tend to isolate when we get anxious, unfortunately. How can I bring them in? I can't get, even get them in all in one room. How, and do you have any tips? Mm, wow. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm curious. So I'm assuming that you're talking about you, you and your family, you, you all reside in the same household. Is, is that, is that correct? Um, let's see. And I don't know if um if uh Tyree Tyree if you want to speak, you can just let me you can send you can raise your hand if you want to speak or if you just want to do questions, I wanna respect everyone if they don't feel comfortable um talking. Or you can just let me know in the in the chat box if you want to talk. Yeah, so so Tyree, so I'm gonna unmute Tyree. Um hold on, give me a second. Um we can have a look. Okay, here we are. And you are unmuted now, so we should hear you. It takes about Two or three seconds, and let's see. Can you hear us? Hello? Tyrese, are you there? Oh, it looks like maybe, okay, maybe they can't talk. Let me see, let me just check at the end. Um, it says, yeah, but maybe they can't talk. Okay, so I'm going to back, go back to muting them. Um, looks like they can't talk. Terry, can you hear? Are you there? Okay. All right. Um, so they type something in the question box. Um, okay. Don't know how to not not this, um they having some problem unmuting them, but they're saying it's correct that they all are in the same house. So that is correct, Dion. So. Okay. So so some of it I think too is going to depend on um, the ages of the people who are in the house, um, and then really thinking about. When you when you think about togetherness with them, it may be that you have to um, it may be that you have to shift your perspective about how you see togetherness. So it could be that you know if you are able to know maybe there's something that um, Maybe 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 there's a task that your brother enjoys. Maybe your brother enjoys video games, and so you decide, you know what, I'm I'm going to play video game with my brother. Maybe you decide, you know what, let's find out what everybody likes, and then we can spend, you know, maybe 15 minutes doing that one thing, and we can we can rotate it. Um, it may be something that you have to do gradually, just kind of depending upon the level of anxiety people have. Um, I, I know that I'm not giving you something concrete, but it's a little it's a little hard to be able to give you specifics without knowing um, how severe the anxiety is or what's causing the anxiety. Um, but it might be that you may just have to change your change your expectations around how you get that quality time with them. And it may be that, you know, you are um, having quality time with each one of them individually. Or it may be that you have quality time with, you know, a couple of them at the, at a time. Um, but also, we want to also make sure that we're respecting, you know, where everyone is in terms of their anxiety, and so that they are feeling comfortable um, to to socialize and to interact and to engage with everyone. Sometimes it can be a very gradual process, um, and, and it's not one that you want to rush. You have to sometimes allow people to kind of, you know grow in terms of their comfort to engage with others so yeah thank you Dion. i have another question from garrick and garrick says do and i'll take this one um do any of you have a mantra you recite to calm yourself down in intense moments what was the process that led you to create it so i do have a mantra my simple one is that um, i am present i am rooted i am here and what I do is I kind of do things that help me feel really grounded. So I'll press my feet into the ground. I'll like, you know, make sure I'm, I'll check my posture and I'll take deep breaths. And I will repeat to myself, I am present, I am rooted, I am here. Or I will say, I am present, I am grounded, I am here. And for me, that just kind of, I imagine myself having roots that kind of like go into the earth and that like, I am a tree. And that really kind of like makes me feel like, like um, present in the moment. Um, that's been a really helpful exercise for me. 
Um, breathing is a great way for me also to kind of like um, de-escalate myself or calm myself. And I always suggest people, if you, even if you can't um, take your breathing um, isn't your thing, sometimes it's taking a sacred pause. When I sit there, like I put the timer on 60 seconds, I just think to sit here and not do anything. Like, you know what I mean? Sometimes that's just a great practice too, to get ourselves out of the, create a little bit of space for ourselves. So that's one that um, mantra I create. And I, and, I, and I just kind of like, you know, I read a lot of mantras and like, um, also just like, and also just figure out what I need to hear. Sometimes figuring out what do you need to say to yourself to affirm yourself. Thinking of myself, I, th I think of myself as having an inner child. And so I think about if I was talking to a child who was going through what I'm experiencing, what I would say, what, how would I say that to them? And I think about how simple and easy that could be. And sometimes it's very easy for me to say those same things to myself in those moments of distress. So it's giving you that, that's my response to that, um, Garrick. Thank you for the question. I have a question for you, Dion. Um, uh, Ebony wants to know, do you have any supporting sites uh, with theories on corporate PTSD? Oh, wow. Theories on corporate PTSD. Mm. Mm -hmm. I can't say that I do. Um, I, so one of the things that I might encourage you to do is um, in order to get in order to get um, some sites that pertain specifically to that, um, you may go to sites that deal specifically with organizational psychology. Um, they may be able to have some resources for you that help you to um, to get a little bit more information about corporate PTSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, while we don't have um, anything on our website, like I said, we do have our emotional and leadership training, which navigates organizational wellness, and we have an assessment tool, which we can talk more about as well. Um, in our future training, we'll be talking more about, so putting that out there as well. Um, next question I have, we have a lot of questions in here, so we're going to take a couple more because I want to be mindful of stuff every time. But um, Angel says, how do we decrease the emotional, physical impact of microaggressions on our health? I will tell you, this is also a very big question that is very nuanced based on your circumstance and your condition and where you're at, you know? Um, there's no one size fits all response to this. It's really something I would like to, I like to like really sit down with somebody and tease out. Um, one of the things, some of the things that I've done with communities, um, and it depends, like once again, it depends on your work environment and your, and like the racial, the gender dynamics and all the pieces of what's happening. But one thing I've seen that's really curious to one group that I work with is um, people started naming the microaggressions and when they were happening. And it was really curious. You can't do that in every environment because that would lead to some kind of like hostility. But it was a lot of work that was done with them preemptively to talk about microaggressions. They had a lot of investment in trying to create a safer, more emotional, uh, more safely, more safe emotional infrastructure. And so one of the things they started doing was they implemented kind of like an ouch or like that uh, microaggression, um, like, you know, kind of called like naming it when it showed up. And then it would pause. And they would have to have to do instant and do a 60 minute pause, 60 second pause, excuse me. And then they would talk about what just happened, right? It's really important too, I think, when we talk about like transforming organizations and um, microaggressions of these cultures, we have to like, 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 tell them what you're saying, we have to start small, right? Like, we, like, we have these great tools and these big tools, but you can't just come and try to flip the table over and expect everything to change overnight. It really is a gradual education and buy in and increasing safety, particularly for places where that have not been safe to name and call those things out. So, it really is a gradual process um, of um, doing that work. But, um, yeah, so just kind of to answer that piece around that. Um, let's see. I see. Brittany says, can you have anxiety toward a certain race if they are constantly causing some negative activity in your work life? Can I have anxiety towards white men in positions of power? Brittany, the answer to that is yes. That's all we <laughs> <laughs> yes. that, that, We didn't even got to go into that one no more. Yes. Yes. You absolutely can. I mean, and that's reality, right? There are, there are black trans folks who feel a lot of anxiety going into places that are dominated by black cis folks because they're used to have so much transphobic violence. There are black women who are uncomfortable going into spaces with black men because black men have committed so much sexual harm and violence, right? So absolutely, that anxiety can show up in terms of how we're relating to folks. And it's something that we're constantly navigating, right? So like, absolutely, to your question, um, yes. And then, um, what I recently wanted to let you know, Dion, that um, I definitely felt that, what you said. I refuse to give up because they're my family, but I will allow them more space to grow as well. Thank you so much. All right. You're very and welcome. Thank you for your question. Um, and so, and that is all of our questions. Um, we still got about 30, 35 people still left, so about, you know, about 15, 20 people left, but everybody, we appreciate y'all staying in and hanging in with us. 
Um, oh, uh, oh, so I know we're out of over time, but I just want to make sure we name otherwise the practice. Um, Dion, did you want to talk about the candle piece while we just got a couple of folks here still for a moment? Sure. So we want to just, um, for, for some of you who may not have um, had practice, um, practicing being in the in the now or practicing mindfulness. We we want to just take some time to to practice that with you. This is a, a a very easy exercise that you can do on your own. And so, if you are so inclined, I'm going to invite you all to just sit and relax. I want you to pay attention to the the candle that is burning. Um, if you are visually impaired, I am inviting you to visualize a single burning flame in a dark room. And I just want you to pay attention to that flame, okay? As you're paying attention to that flame, if you are so inclined, I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath in through your nose and slowly release through your mouth. And I will give you the directive to do that. So we're gonna, starting now, take a deep breath in through our nose Slowly release out through our mouth. Continue to look at the flame in through your nose. Slowly out through your mouth. I want you to continue to breathe in through your nose. Slowly out through your mouth. And as you're doing that, I want you to continue to focus on the flame. Breathe in through your nose, slowly out through your mouth, focusing on the flame. If you have other distractions that are coming to mind, redirect your attention to the flame. In through your nose, slowly out through your mouth. I want you to continue to pay attention to the flame and in through your nose. Slowly out through your mouth. And if you're able to, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to envision the flame that you've been looking at while you continue to breathe in through your nose. Slowly out through your mouth. Look at the flame that's in your mind. If your mind wanders, you're welcome to open your eyes and look at the flame again bringing all of your attention to the flame in through your nose, slowly out through your mouth. If you have distraction of thoughts and things that you should be doing, redirect yourself to the flame in through your nose, slowly out through your mouth. Again, in through your nose, Slowly out through your mouth, pay attention to the flame, and now open your eyes. This is one of the practices that we that we call being present, being in the here and now. Sometimes if you have a mind like, like mine um, that's busy all the time, it may be very difficult for you to focus on your breathing with your eyes closed. You may need a visual. Um, and, and I find that sometimes if you do this, you, you, you have a candle um, in a dark room, um, or even if you take a bath and you run a bath, you turn the lights out, you, turn on, you, um, you light a candle and you sit there and you breathe and you focus on the, on the candle, it can be very relaxing. For other individuals, as you're getting used to the idea of being in the present moment, in the here and now, um, even things like you know, if, if you are a runner, you know, listening to the footsteps, you know, and that cadence that you have and, and keeping keeping your focus on the here and now in terms of those footsteps. If you like being out in nature, if you can just get in tune with the sounds that you're hearing, um, even some of the smells that you that that you have. And, and when you look at um, when you think about the surroundings and the sights that you see and just being in the moment of all of those things. That's what we call practicing the here and now and being in the moment. And that's what this is about, particularly if you experience anxiety, if your anxiety has been exacerbated as a result of what's going on with this crisis. Find some time in your day to just be in the here and now, to just focus on your breath, 
while also, even if it takes having a visual for you to just focus on that visual so that your mind can just be still for a moment. I'll say, so good, Dion. I love it, love it, love it. Um, so with that being said, this concludes our presentation. We want to thank you. We got a lot of folks who stayed. I mean, people are still hanging out with us. So that means a lot to us so that much. you find yes. this work helpful. Um, so many people still in the room. Um, we will be sending out a survey afterwards for this. Um, and so I invite you, if you can fill that survey, it gives us good feedback. We're able to offer these trainings and these workshops for free thanks to our funders. So if you really, the way you help make a donation to us is by basically filling out that evaluation and letting people know how much this helps. Um, please check out our website, beam.community. We have a lot of other tools. We'll have these tools. Download them, share them with your folks. We, we give them to you because we want you to use them. You know, use them and talk with folks and send them under the phone, whatever makes sense. But we're so grateful for, you know, you all being present. We're grateful for you being being here. We're sending you all so much love and support at this time. And if there's ever an idea or something that you would like to see us to do, don't hesitate to reach out to us. I just sent every, our emails out to everybody on the um, listserv. Um, I just want to say thank you. And also thank you to Dr. Bates for doing such a great job of holding this space together today for it, um, taking us through exploring anxiety. So much gratitude to you, Dion, for the work you do with us and just in the world at large. So. So thank much gratitude. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, with that said, that concludes our time. Thank you all so much. We'll send a recording of the webinar as well. So, if you folks want to have a recording, you can also share with folks. Thank you so much. Sending you much love. Wait, 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 and, wait, wait, and, wait, 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 Oh my God! See, this is why we can't do nothing. We can't do nothing. We can't do nothing. We can't get, get, get have nothing nice. <laughs> if you would like to stay and see a video of Dion twerking, Dr. Bates twerking, send it. You know, I'm just kidding. No, there will be. It's time for the percolator. <laughs> webinar. It's time for the percolator. Is, uh, okay. All right. It's time to go. Y'all, be blessed. Take care of yourselves. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.